Thank you so much, and welcome to all of you. The last time I was invited to speak, we had a blizzard. <laughs> and tonight, it's a record low. So I'm going to suggest, John, that you invite me back in the summertime when it's really hot, and maybe I can bring some cool weather. Um, I'd like to say hello to the people in um, television land, computer land. Um, welcome. I'm glad to see you um, here. If my granddaughter Juniper is watching, Junie, I love you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, the title of the talk this evening um, is obviously Perspectives from Jung. Probably many of you have read the works of Jung, and I'm hoping quite fervently that you are not expecting a deep Jungian analysis tonight. Because that's not likely to happen. I'm not a Jungian analyst. Um, however, I am a student of the ancient wisdom. And so much of what Jung had to say and so much of what he had to offer gives us guidance in terms of that spiritual path. And that's sort of what we're going to be talking about this evening. So I hope if you came for a Jungian analysis, you won't be too disappointed, but that you will find some interesting things to think about in the days, minutes ahead. So just a little bit about Carl Jung, in case you don't know. Um, he was born in 1875. He was a psychiatrist. In 1907, he was introduced to Freud and became very close to Freud. He worked with Freud. He perceived Freud as a father figure. In about 1910, 1912, he started to back away from Freud. He was uncomfortable with Freud's psychosexual orientation. And um, finally, in 1914, he resigned all of the positions he held in the International Association of Psychoanalysis. He went into a period of turmoil in his own personal life and came out of that with his own theory, psych analytic psychology. So many components to that. Um, but the component we're going to be talking about primarily tonight is that process of individuation that he discussed in detail, striving toward wholeness through the unification of the conscious and the unconscious. He was a scientist, a medical doctor, of course, as a psychiatrist. He was also seen as a dissident when he stepped away from Freud and created his own theoretical orientation. He was a mystic, he was an occultist, and he was a philosopher. He actually did his um, doctoral dissertation on occultism, which I found mm -hmm. quite interesting. So many contributions to our language, our modern language, to psychology, to counseling, to our whole thought process today. Very few of these are, are probably um, surprising to you. But I will talk about one thing that I found surprising, and it's this personality typology. Probably some of you have heard of the Myers-Briggs personality test. Well, it was Jung's work that led to the basis of that typology test. So probably you're thinking now, OK, now what am I? Well, I'm going to guess that most of you are INFPs. Okay? I'll give you the description. No, you're not. OK. <laughs> All right. I know that I'm always the I. But um, idealistic, loyal to their values and to people who are important to them. Their external life has to be, or they want their external life to be congruent with their values. They can be curious, quick to see possibilities, can be catalysts for implementing ideas. They seek to understand people and help them achieve their full potential. They're adaptable, they're flexible, and they're accepting unless their values are threatened. Sounds like many seekers on the path to me. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the objects of the Theosophical Society. This is where we are at the Theosophical Society in America. These are the three declared objects of the Theosophical Society, and they're 
original language, which is a little bit older language, um, as you can see by the brotherhood of humanity. By that we mean all of us, not just the brothers, but the sisters as well, and anything in between and far beyond. The objects in a little bit more modern language. The Theosophical Society was also founded in 1875, just like Jung, and took off sharing lots of ideas that will help us on this spiritual path. You may wonder why I brought the objects in front of us, and it's because these objects flow so beautifully with the work of Jung. I'm going to share with you some of the writings of Rohit Mehta on the theosophical approach to life that come from the three objects of the Theosophical Society. Rohit Mehta was a, a leader in the Theosophical Society, a writer. Um, he won the Subha Rao Award for his work within the Theosophical Society. And he says, the three objects of the Theosophical Society form one integrated whole. They cannot, therefore, be considered in isolation, separated one from the other. It is when we do so that we wrongly evaluate the work of the Theosophical Society. Together, the three objects indicate what may be called the Theosophical Approach to Life. The Theosophical Society stands preeminently for brotherhood. And brotherhood implies right perception of things objective. How to come to this right perception? Well, it is this which is indicated under the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, and under the search for the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. Meta tells us that when we address the second object and study comparative religion, philosophy, and science, we are expanding the mind. Dora Kuntz, past president of the Theosophical Society in America, used to say, crack your brain, sweetie pie, crack your brain, when she wanted me to think a little bit further and expand my mind. And that's what I think of. And studying that comparative religion, philosophy, and science certainly cracks my mind. He goes further and states that the third object deals with transcending the mind. He points out that psychic abilities such as clairvoyance and clairaudience are simply extensions of the physical abilities. And studying these issues do not bring us any closer to understanding the mysteries of life. Maida writes that unexplained must mean unperceived, and that the power latent in humanity must mean a new dimension of consciousness, a consciousness that transcends the limitations of the mind. He questions our ability to explore some thing that is beyond our mind. How can the mind knows, know what lies beyond it? Meta states that it is only when the mind becomes quiet that we can begin to comprehend what is beyond it. He writes, it is when the mind becomes a perfect reflecting medium that new facets of the human personality can be discovered. And in the discovery of the new facets of human personality, there takes place also the discovery of unexplained laws of nature. Thus, the powers latent in man and unexplained laws of nature are interrelated, or to put it differently, the discovery of the one naturally leads to the discovery of the other. So back to Jung. His concept of individuation, which is the concept that we will primarily be looking at this evening. Jung said that our goal in life is to become aware of the unconscious, to make the unconscious conscious. And the process of doing that is the process of individuation. And at the end of that process, we come to the center. And the self 
the archetype, is in that center. It's all about finding that center. Very much like the objects of the Theosophical Society, through right perception, expansion of the mind, transcending the mind, to spiritually transform. That's our goal. That's our goal. Different words, but that is our goal. Another diagram. So Jung created his theory, analytic psychology, which is well known and, and used a great deal and studied even more today. And the concept within it of individuation, of making the unconscious conscious to individuation, to work toward individuation. The theosophical objects, right perception, expanding the mind, transcending the mind, to find the center, to go within. And then finding that which is hidden within. Jung denied his mystical occult side for a good part of his life, or in a good portion of his life, at least publicly, um, and focused on the, science, the scientist part of his persona. Um, but his teachings encourage the same ideas of the Theosophical Society, that purpose of finding what's within. Okay. By now, you probably all decided that I can't figure out what it is I'm talking about. Am I talking about the Theosophical Society? Am I talking about Carl Jung? Jung and now I'm talking about Native Americans. But it really does all come together at some point, hopefully. All right. So I want to share this story with you. There's a Native American myth that recounts that the Creator gathered all of creation together and said, I want to hide something from humans until they are ready for it. It is the realization that they can create their own life and their own reality. And the eagle said, give it to me. I'll take it to the moon and hide it there. But the Creator said, no. One day, they will go there and find it. So the salmon said, give it to me, and I'll hide it in the bottom of the sea. And the Creator said, no, they'll get there too. And then the buffalo said, give it to me. I'll bury it in the plains. And the Creator said, no, no, they will get there. They will cut into the skin of the earth, and they will find it even there. And so Grandmother Mole came, the one who has no physical eyes to see on the outside, but has spiritual eyes and the capacity to see on the inside. And she said, put it inside them. They will never find it there. <laughs> and the Creator said, it is done. So here we are, back to traveling the spiritual path. What is the spiritual path? Well, there are so many. Probably everyone in this room perceives the spiritual path differently. Maybe we're all on a little bit different spiritual path. Everyone out in computer land is on their own spiritual path. For this evening, and I'm not going to try to define that for anyone else, certainly, um, but I do need to have sort of a basis from which to start this evening. So tonight we'll talk about the spiritual path as that path that leads to conscious awareness of our divinity and the divinity of all beings, the path of wholeness, the path within, where so few people are willing to look. I love this picture, by the way. Because I'm not sure, I think you can see it. The path is full of rocks and roots and things to trip us, me, you, whomever. And it disappears into the tangled web, which it certainly feels like the path is at times, a lot of times. I debated a great deal about reading these quotes. And I finally decided to give myself permission to read the quotes. I know you can all read, but his words are like music to the soul, and I almost can't help myself. The more critical reason dominates, the more impoverished life becomes. 
But the more the unconscious and the more of myth we are capable of making conscious, the more life we integrate. That sounds like HPB's writing in Voice of the Silence. The mind is the great slayer of the real. This is nothing new. We've all thought of this. The mind is the slayer of the real. How does it slay the real? Well, in so many ways. We know this. The mind keeps us busy. It keeps us so busy. Um, it keeps us from looking inside. It keeps us from focusing internally and keeps us focused externally so that we're not finding the unconscious. We're not finding that reality within. Our careers, our to-do lists, our families, our chores, all of these things, they keep us focused externally. That monkey mind that, that constantly jumps from thought to thought when we're trying to meditate. Jung says, thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. So easy to stay in our heads. So easy to avoid feelings, to avoid our vulnerabilities, to avoid our pain, to avoid looking at what's not out there. But if we don't look inside, we don't get anywhere. We don't get anywhere. I love this picture. It's such a beautiful metaphor for the conscious and the unconscious. And for Jung's quote, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside, awakes. It's so beautiful. We think that the external world is real. And you know, we study, we know that it's not. But I tell you what, when you walk outside that door in a little while, that six below or 10 below or whatever it is, that's going to feel very real. When you have to get up to go to work tomorrow morning, it's going to feel very real when the alarm clock goes off. And it is real to our personalities. It is real in this physical world, but it's not the end. It's not the end. When we look within, when we make the unconscious conscious, when we begin to transcend the mind, that's when we begin to find reality with a capital R. But not many people are willing to do that. Look what Jung says. Jung says, about a third of my cases are suffering from no clinically definable neurosis, but from the restlessness and emptiness of their lives. This can be defined as the general neurosis of our time. And even though he may have written that, uh, who knows how long ago, well, I would know if I had written it down. But he wrote it a long time ago. It's still true, isn't it? How many people do we know whose lives are empty, who don't look further than, mm, I really need to get a raise. I need to get a raise. Well, you know what? Money's important. We have to pay our bills, don't we? We do live in this physical world. But if that's all we're looking at, if all we're looking at is, gosh, can I, can I get a promotion? Um, if only I had a nicer house. I need a nicer car. I need a car that has seat warmers so that I'm not freezing when I sit down. <clears throat> the thing is that these cases came to him. These people came to him because they knew something wasn't right. So, so many people who are leading these lives, they know something's not right. They know there's something else, but they don't know quite what it is. Oh. Jung said, through pride, we are ever deceiving ourselves, but deep down below the surface of the average conscience, a small, still voice says to us, something is out of tune. We know there's something more, that divine discontent. And so he talks about meaning, that meaning comes when people feel they are living the symbolic life, that they're actors in the divine drama, that gives, that gives the only meaning to human life. Everything else is banal and you can dismiss it. 
A career, producing of children are all maya, illusion, compared to that one thing, that your life is meaningful. Well, I certainly love thinking of myself as an actor in a divine drama. And I think that were we able to do that, that would give us a better perspective. I'm not sure I 100% agree with him that everything else is banal and can be dismissed. I, you know, I do need to pay my bills, so my career is important to me. You know, our children are important to us, aren't they? They're our next generation, the people we love. They're not banal. However, Jung was so focused on his work that he did live this and believe, and he lived this. He believed it, he lived it. His, um, there's a story that says he was um, on one of his rare trips with his entire family. He and his wife had five children. He was on um, a trip with his wife and children, and the children were playing, and um, he gave one of his daughters um, something. And she ran up to her mother, and she said, look what Franz's father gave me. And her mother said, he's your father too. <laughs> Not a deep connection there. His, his work was focused in the analytical psychology. So I understand where he's coming from. I'm not sure I agree with it. The decisive question for man is, is he, and let me just catch myself here, for man, humanity, all of us. The decisive question for all of us is, are we related to something infinite or not? Only if we know that the thing which truly matters is the infinite can we avoid fixing our interests upon futilities and upon all kinds of goals which are not of real importance. If we understand and feel that here in this life we already have a link with the infinite, desires and attitudes change. Our desires and attitudes change because our focus becomes more clear. We realize this is not all there is. We want to look further. This is when we start to transcend the mind. He writes, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light of meaning in the darkness of mere being. We're working towards that. That's beneath his, his concept of individuation, where we make the unconscious conscious and unite the two so that we can travel to the center. And until we do that, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct, as he says, let me, let me give you the exact quote. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So once an individual realizes that he or she has control and they can change, they have control over their lives, they find what the Creator has hidden within, a light is lit in the darkness of mere being. It's no longer about getting a raise or getting a promotion or a car with seat warmers. It's about the infinite. Change begins to occur and we have conscious awareness of our choices. I had a client, I'm, I'm a counselor, I'm not a Jungian analyst as I said, but I am a counselor. And I had a client who came in to see me one day and he said, um, Look, I came because my fiancé said I had to. Um, I'm, I keep losing my temper, it really bothers her, and I'm getting in trouble at work now. I've been called into the office, I've been written up, it's a real problem for me. Okay, But, you know, I don't really know why I'm here because I've always had a temper. I've always had a temper. My grandfather had a temper, my mother has a temper. If you're a Smith, you've got a temper. That's just the way it goes. So, you know, I, I don't know why she sent me. She just needs to get over it. She just needs to understand that once in a while I'm going to lose my temper. There may be holes in the walls. I might punch a hole in the wall. might scream and shout. You know, but that's just the way it is. She just needs to get over it. Oh, that 
just makes me shake inside. I don't know how it makes you feel, but it drives me crazy because we know we can change, don't we? We're not just accepting that. That's just the way it is. That's part of uniting that conscious, conscious component of us and our unconscious component. So what is behind the anger? What is behind the anger? I did convince him to stay for a few sessions. Actually, it continued on for quite a while. Um, but what we started talking about was his life. OK, I hear that you don't want to be here. But tell me about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about growing up. And tell me about, I just want to know about you. And so he starts talking. But eventually, he starts to tell a story about a time when he was a teenager, when he was accused of doing something that he had not done. And so the police came to his house. And they took him to the police station for questioning. And no one was listening to him. He was trying to say, I didn't do this. I really didn't do this. Um, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. And so the police questioned him, and they questioned his mother, and they sent them home, and they continued their investigation. But of course, as things happened, it got out in the neighborhood. So the neighborhood children weren't allowed to play with him anymore, and the neighborhood parents would look at him like he was a criminal as he walked down the street. And he felt very isolated and very alone. And then we started talking about what it is that makes him angry when he's at work. And he started talking about times. And eventually, he got to the point where he realized he was angry because he wasn't being heard, because people were assuming things about him that weren't true. And that pushed all those old buttons, all that unconscious stuff that he had pushed away. And the more we talked about it and the more he could put those two together, his anger decreased. It was almost like magic. I didn't do anything. He did. He made a portion of his unconscious conscious. He shone the light on it. And it changed his life. So that then he could start to work on other things, other techniques to deal with annoyance and frustration. But he didn't have those angry outbursts. They didn't have the holes in the wall. They didn't have the yelling. And this is what Jung is talking about. This is what the Creator is talking about, finding that which is hidden within and bringing it out. That's why we work to expand our mind and transcend our mind. Jung says, to find out what is truly individual in ourselves, profound reflection is needed. And suddenly we realize how uncommonly difficult the discovery of individuality is. Jung doesn't say reflection. He says profound reflection. Profound reflection. Reflection upon ourselves. Not about someone else. It's easy to reflect on other people. I think that's where that judgment part comes in. But when we're reflecting on ourselves, when we're willing to look at ourselves, at that shadow aspect of ourselves that Jung talks about, those pieces that we don't want people to see, the pieces that we don't even want to see about ourselves. I think, for me, this is the hardest part of walking the spiritual path, is looking at myself, profound reflection on me and what I do and why I do it. Looking at that unconscious as much as I possibly can to make it conscious so that I can make conscious, aware decisions of how I live my life on a daily basis. He wrote, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. I love that picture. I'll tell another story on Jung. When he was young, when he was about 12 years old, he was at school, 
and a classmate knocked him down hard, knocked him down hard, and he hit his head and it knocked him out and he became, he was unconscious. And he remembers that when he came back to consciousness, he thought, now I don't have to go back to school anymore. And from that day on, every time a thought came into his mind about going to school or about doing schoolwork, he lost consciousness, he passed out, he fainted and no one could figure out what was wrong with him. And the doctors finally decided that he must have epilepsy and he stayed home for six months. Don't tell your children this. <laughs> Don't tell your children this. And so one day he happened to hear his father talking to a visitor and his father was saying, oh, poor Carl, I don't know what we're gonna do. He, won't, he can't go to school, he can't learn. I don't know how he's gonna support himself. I, I don't know how he's gonna end up. And all of a sudden, he realized at that moment that this was inside of him, that he was making this. So we went and got his Latin grammar book, of all things. I think I would have chosen something much easier. But he went and got his Latin grammar book, and he says that he fainted three times as he started to do this work. But he realized that this is what he needed to do. And so he persevered and he continued, no matter how faint he felt, he continued to study and push his way through. And in a few weeks, he was able to go back to school. He faced that pain. He faced what he had pushed into his unconscious, brought it into the light, and changed his life. Because I'm guessing it would have been hard to be become a psychiatrist had he never gone back to school. He wrote, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it appears outside as fate. I love my clients. They teach me so much every single day. So I had a client come to me. I'm going to call her Annie. That's not her name. Um, but she came to me. She'd had a childhood that was very difficult, a very difficult childhood. And she had taken in all sorts of negative messages about herself, that she wasn't important, that she wasn't worthy, that she was not lovable, that she shouldn't exist, essentially, that she should not exist. And she fought her whole life to keep going, even though these negative messages were constantly going inside of her head, constantly going. And she came to see me, and we started to work, work on this. And it was so amazing to me. We'd start working on a particular issue, say abandonment, and her abandonment issues. And all of a sudden, life would just jump up into her face and I, I, there's no other way for me to describe it, it would slap her. And it would slap her three times. It wasn't like one thing came up about the abandonment issues, but three things. And she'd say, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Her abandonment issues, her, she, we were struggling, she was struggling with those, we were working with those. She gets a phone call that her mother's been hospitalized because she attempted suicide. Mother's leaving, abandonment. Her birthday is the next week, hates her birthday. Nobody ever celebrated her birthday. Nobody ever cared that she was born from her perspective. Hates her birthday. And then she gets a call from school asking her to come in for a conference because her child's grades are falling and he has been acting out in school. So here we go, unworthy, incapable. All of this happened all together all internal, but it looks like it's fate. Why is this happening to me? When we don't take the unconscious and make it conscious, it slaps us in the face, doesn't it? And we all know this because it happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. This client had the strength the perseverance, and the determination to keep working. And we worked together for quite a while, several years. And I kept wanting so much for her to see 
her connection with the infinite, to work through this process that Jung talks about of individuation, of making the unconscious conscious and finding that center and knowing her connection with the infinite, with all of us, so that not only would she never be lonely and feel isolated because we are all one, but also because then she would know the love that pervades the universe, that is there for each and every one of us, that we're all worthy. We're all the same. None is more, none is less. We are all one. And she got there. She got there. It's still a struggle for her once in a while. Struggle for all of us, isn't it, once in a while? Absolutely. But for the most part, she got there. She took what was unconscious, what she didn't want to face, what she didn't like about herself that she had pushed away, things that had happened in her past that she couldn't remember, in her unconscious, and slowly, piece by piece, took them out and looked and made them conscious. She shone a light on mere being so that she could truly live. So incredible. Jung wrote, it's not a matter of proving the existence of the light, but of blind people who do not know that their eyes could see. It is high time we realized that it is pointless to praise the light and preach it if nobody can see it. It is much more needful to teach people the art of seeing. And that's what Carl Jung did in his pro when he talked about the process of individuation. That's what the objectives, the three objects of the Theosophical Society are doing as well. That's what the ancient wisdom no matter who says it, Theosophical Society, Carl Jung, someone else, you, me, whoever, it doesn't matter. It's about sharing information that teaches people the art of seeing. How do we do that? Well, of course, if I had you know, the answer, the one, two, three, I could, I could donate a gazillion million dollars to the Theosophical Society. Um, there is no one, two, three. It's that hard work of taking that unconscious, that hard work of expanding the mind, of right perception, of transcending the mind to find what's hidden within that so few people really want to do. Because when we see what's inside, then we can begin to see. An incredibly difficult task. I certainly don't mean to sound as if this is something we can do this week, next week, this incarnation, or even into the next incarnation. But this is our path. This is where we're going. Jung wrote, life has always seemed to be like a plant that lives on its rhizome. If you are not a biologist, I'm not a biologist. I had to look it up. A rhizome is the root, like this one, that sort of curls in on itself. And I'll just admit my own ignorance. And if you didn't know it either, then I happily share that with you so you don't have to admit it either. It's true life is invisible, hidden in the rhizome. The part that appears above ground lasts only a single summer. Then it withers away. An ephemeral apparition. When we think of the unending growth and decay of life and civilizations, we cannot escape the impression of absolute nullity. Yet I have never lost a sense of something that lives and endures underneath the eternal flux. What we see is the blossom which passes. The rhizome remains. To travel the spiritual path, it is important that we recognize that we are more than we appear. We can ap appreciate the bloom, or maybe we don't like this particular bloom, but there'll be another. Regardless, it doesn't matter. It's not about the bloom. 
It's about the eternal roots because that is who we are, the eternal roots that always remain. If you go to thinking, take your heart with you. If you go to love, take your head with you. Love is empty without thinking, thinking hollow without love. We can't get to the center uh, without our heads and our hearts. Just like we can't get to the center without uniting the conscious and the unconscious. It takes both. It takes both. We must use our hearts and our heads to find that reality within. We use our hearts and our heads to find the courage, the strength, the perseverance, and the wisdom to look inside, to travel the spiritual path, the path of wholeness, the path within. Thank you. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Ed. <laughs> Uh, you use the, uh, or you and Jung use the metaphor within and inside. Within and inside what? Well, you know, if I had the answer to that one, I could also donate a gazillion million dollars to the Theosophical Society. You know, I think because we live on this physical plane, we have to think in terms of inside, outside, within, without, up, down, layers, levels. So where is that? I can't tell, tell you. For me, I feel it in my heart. I you. Yeah, that's where I feel it. You know, others may feel it different places. I don't know. And I don't know that anybody really knows where that really is. But for me, it's in my heart when I look to find that place within. Barbara, um, I like the quote about when the inner situation is not made conscious, it appears outside as fate. Um, if, is it the way that works, if, if we see something outside of us and it doesn't bother us, maybe it, it's not within, but if we see something and it either causes attraction or aversion to that thing that we're seeing, then it might be within us and it's something we need to work on. Is that the easiest, is that an easy one? That's certainly what I, how I would interpret that. Um, when something, and, and again, I can only speak for myself. Um, when things happen to me or happen in my life, and I, they slap me, they slap me. I, I, there's just no better way to, to describe it. When I get slapped, I'm like, oh, okay. Okay, where's this coming from? What am I supposed to learn from this? And how far do I have to go to learn it? And that's when, for me, I go inside um, so that I can look at who I am, look at maybe a piece of me that I'm not really delighted about. Um, because maybe whatever's happening outside is uh, a projection of my shadow self that I don't really want to see. And so maybe that's something I need to look at. <laughs>